So, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us um, on this nice Thursday common hour. I appreciate everyone turning up. Um, welcome to the SJU SATA kickoff event. So today we're just going to be going over like all the board members, what we're going to be doing for the semester. We want to hear back from you guys and what you want to do for the semester um, towards the end. And we'll have a special Raspberry Pi um, DNS sinkhole presentation after we do the introduction. So um, without any further ado, why don't we start introductions? All right. I guess I'll head that off. Um, I'm Isaac. I'm going to be co-president of SJU um, SATA these next two semesters. Um, for those who don't know me, I am a senior majoring in cybersecurity, minoring in digital forensics. I'm going to be kind of your point of contact for anything cyber related, so feel free to reach out. Great. And I'm Vince. I was um, previously the VP of Computer Science Society, but obviously we've merged now. I'm going into my senior year studying comp sci and mathematics and um, just love to code. It's all about me. And um, okay. So what's up guys, I'm Faison, I'll be your Vice President, and I'm currently a junior and I'm pursuing a five-year dual degree program where I get a Bachelor's in Computer Science and a Master's in Data Science, and currently I'm doing research with my professor related to detecting COVID-19 with deep learning, so if you're interested in anything AI-related, uh, feel free to reach out. Hello everyone, my name's Nicole, I'll be your events coordinator this semester. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm in my senior year, and my major is cybersecurity systems. Looking forward to meeting you all this semester. Hey guys, um, I'm Deontay. I'll, I'll be your treasurer this year. I'm a sophomore computer science major, and yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting everyone and doing a lot of cool projects with you guys. Hey guys, my name is Roshni Shukla. I am a junior and a cybersecurity major, and I'll be your information officer this semester. Looking forward to meeting all of you and um, seeing all the familiar names that have been there last year. Hey guys, I'm Jillian Durego. I am a senior, and this year I'm going to be your uh, social media coordinator, and I am a cybersecurity major and a senior this year. And I can't wait to meet you guys in person. It sucks that we have to be online for right now. And okay. All right, so that is everyone this year. Obviously, Thomas isn't here with us, but you'll meet him uh, possibly next meeting. Okay, so um, I just wanted to go over with you guys what the plan is, right? Because we're all stuck at home. We're all virtual. It's a little bit different, but we're still aiming and we're doing a lot of planning with each other so that we can make sure you guys have the best technology experience that you've had through all of the meetings um, these past years. If you're new, thanks for joining us. So obviously, if you guys, um, you guys should have already picked it up that SGU CompSci and SGU Cyber wound up merging over the summer. So I know there might be a little bit of confusion over when there's going to be cyber meetings, when there's going to be CompSci meetings. We're gonna be doing a mixed approach. So we'll either have it so that halfway through the time, right, we'll switch over to CompSci or Cyber, so it's split halfway. Sometimes we'll be focusing on Cyber for the week, vice versa with CompSci. So we're just going to play it by however we um, think the best material for you guys is for the week. That's what we're going to be doing as a team for you. And, of course, you can check out your email list. If you're not on the email list, we can put you on after. Or check out all of our social media or our website. It'll be posted there um, weekly. So, um, Isaac, why don't you get in, before I go more into what we're doing, why don't you get into yeah. your presentation? So, before we get into the nitty-gritty of what we have planned kind of throughout the semester, um, I'm going to do a quick presentation on a DNS sinkhole um, to kind of give you guys a different learning experience. So, let me share what I have. Gotcha. Perfect. Okay. So, to kind of dig into uh, what I have planned out, first we need to understand what Raspberry Pis are, right? Raspberry Pis are very low cost, um, small single board computers. Um, the most basic Raspberry Pi starts at $5 and the more higher end Raspberry Pi actually costs around $35. So, there's definitely a lot of different things you could do with these Raspberry Pis. Um, something more about them is that they do run their OS is on micro SD cards. Um, my, my micro SD cards can be sold from 8 gigabytes to 128, possibly higher for low cost. It could be used for many different things. Um, 
you could virtually run your own desktop on it, running Raspberry and OS. You could, based on past cyber um, cyber security competitions I've been part of, um, we've had ICS systems run on these Raspberry Pi. So we've actually had water pumps running on these um, small Raspberry Pi computers. Um, as far as side projects go, um, for example, Vince, um, he actually, if you were here last semester, he was actually able to um, make a Ponagachi off of these Raspberry Pis. Um, a Ponagachi, for those who don't know, is a Tamagotchi. Um, however, it's running on a Raspberry Pi and it's basically being fed through wireless packets that it's picking up using BetterCat. Right, yeah. Right. That's, that was actually a, um, a Christmas present for Derek. He was, he's in the meeting right now. So if anyone's interested in, in learning more about um, doing any like packet sniffing with your Raspberry Pi, I could send over the slides or I could talk to you after we're done with the meeting. Okay, now we go into the DNS goals. So what exactly are they? Um, for starters, they go by a lot of different names. Um, they're also known as sinkhole servers, they're also known as internet sinkholes, and also known as black hole DNSs. Um, they're essentially used to spoof DNS servers to present resolving host names of certain of URLs. Um, basically, when a client sends on an outbound request to visit a specific domain, for example, facebook.com, the DNS forwarder usually maps to that domain um, finds out what the correct IP address is and then sends that back to your device and that's how you make that connection to Facebook.com. The DNS Synco, however, what it does is that rather than sending back the correct IP address, it'll send back a, a fake address or an address that isn't correct. For example, 0.0.0. .0. So your device will never resolve the right website and it'll never reach that domain. Um, so these essentially, they could be used not only to prevent access to a lot of different malicious sites, but they could also be used to block a lot of an, a lot of annoying um, advertisements that pop up on your screen. For example, when you're um, visiting a site that maybe you're live streaming something, or if you're trying to play a game on your phone and you're on your Wi-Fi, these could potentially block out all those ads. Um, <clears throat> so the two graphics that we have on the right-hand side, um, I'll explain them right now. The one on the left is typically what your home network would look like. You have your device first. Um, whenever it makes an outbound request, it'll be forwarded to the Raspberry Pi, which is running the DNS sync call. Um, if it determines the um, request to be valid, it'll send it straight over to the router or modem, whichever one you have set up, and then eventually making its way out to the internet. The one on the right is a little bit more different and because that's more of an enterprise level, um, easy to view way of how the packet is sent. The device reaches out to the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi would then reach out to any proxy servers that might be, um, and then gets forwarded to the firewall. And then, if all goes well, reaches the internet. So, what's this? Pop-ups. Aren't they really annoying? Don't you just hate them? So, um, if you're anything like me, you have a little brother who likes to visit a lot of um, game sites, and pop-ups are everywhere. Um, I've had to literally throw out a computer once because it was just unsalvageable from what was going on on it. Um, so, don't you wish all these pop-ups could just disappear? So, with Pi-hole, that's possible. Pi-hole is going to be the software I'm going to be talking to you guys about today on how to actually implement the DNS Inco slash the network-wide ad blocker. So, to start off, it's a free and open source program. Um, it's supported on a number of different OSs, such as Raspberry OS, Ubuntu, Debian, Fedora, and you can run it as a container on Docker. Pi-hole itself can even serve as a DHCP server on your network if you wanted it to do so. There's two means of accessing it. One is CLI-based, a command line interface, and the other is a nice web interface, a GUI version, if you will, that runs on a Lighty server, um, which is an open source um, web server. It's a very lightweight program, um, and the bare minimum to actually run it, um, you would need 512 megabits of RAM and 52 megabytes of hard drive space. So it doesn't really require much to actually run. There's no need to install any client-side software, so it's literally something you just install on a Raspberry Pi, and once you add it to your network, it would affect all the devices connected to that network. Um, aside from that, according to Pi-Hole's documentation, it is very strong and it does support many devices. Um, in the documentation, they actually tested it out on a 4 gigabyte um, VM. 
and it was able to handle over a million queries within 24 hours. So that's a lot of different queries. Um, considering your home network, I doubt you would need a million queries unless you probably have over 20 devices. And even to that extent, I doubt you'll get that far. Um, that being said, it's pretty scalable. And best of all, there is no need to, like I said before, go onto every single device in your house and install something on. All you have to do is once it's set up, um, make your router point to it as a DNS server and any um, DNS um, request will be sent straight to Pi-hole and then returned. So, as far as setting it up, I'm pretty sure you guys are dying to know how to do it. Um, all I used personally was a Raspberry Pi 3. Um, I had a Pi Top C laying around in my house and I wasn't really doing much with it and I was like, why not use it? Um, the price for Raspberry Pi 3 is about $30. It did come with an 8 gigabyte mini, mini SD card, which I did um, flash Raspbian Pi OS Lite onto it. Um, an 8 gigabyte mini SD card literally could cost you about under $10 nowadays. So you're looking at a $50, if not less, setup that I did. There's two methods of actually downloading the software. The first of which is by cloning the Git repository. Um, and the second, which is curlingpihole.net. Um, Personally, I'm not really into pipe installing. I don't really recommend anyone to go into pipe installing, being that there's a lot of security vulnerabilities in pipe installing. Um, best way to go about it is probably going to be cloning that Git repository and installing, um, installing it through there. So uh, the installation is very simple and it's pretty concise. It's pretty straightforward. It's all GUI based. Um, so to kind of show you what that looks like. It literally starts by greeting you and telling you that you're going to turn your device into a network-wide ad blocker. Um, first thing it does after that is that it has you choose if you're going to be using a hardwired Ethernet connection or a Wi-Fi connection. Um, obviously, um, for a better connection and faster resolution, you're going to want to do a wired connection. Um, so that's what I did. I did have a wired connection going on in my house. It then continues to have you either select um, an upstream DNS provi provider, such as Google, Komodo, Cloudflare, Quad9, or you could even enter a custom one. Um, that would probably be for um, possibly a small business level or enterprise level. Then it goes on to providing some third-party um, ad, ad lists, which are lists of specific domains um, just kind of added into this list and you kind of import them. Um, the reason why I provide you these third-party lists is because, keep in mind, Pi-hole was made primarily to be an ad blocker. So its main purpose is to kind of filter out advertisements on your network. Um, after that, it kind of it prompts you to um, choose whether you wanted to just resolve IPv4 requests or if you wanted to do IPv4 and IPv6 requests. It even asks you if you want to set up the web admin interface, which I mentioned earlier. Um, if you do select it, it sets up an instance of a, of a Lighty server, um, like I mentioned before. That is an open source web server. Um, it's very lightweight. It doesn't take up much. It's actually included in that 52 megabyte um, installation I mentioned earlier. Um, the setup continues into asking a couple more questions regarding some specifics and logging and just how specific you want the logging to be. Finally, um, when you're all set up, it prompts you to this screen right over here, which tells you installation complete. Um, once it is complete, you could navigate to the CLI via if you're still in that pie hole or SSH into it, or you could travel to that IP address in your browser. Um, HTTP, in my case, it was 192.168.1.156 admin, and then you have the whole configuration, the whole um, interface in a GUI form on your browser. Of course, once you do set it up, if you do set it up on your own network, change that password. That should be the first thing, as anyone in security knows. Always change default passwords and never keep them um, default. So the web ad, the web portal. Once you head onto the web portal um, via heading to the Pi's IP address um, via the browser, you're greeted to the screen I have on the top right. Um, what that screen is, it's essentially the dashboard. It just kind of shows you a quick glance of the queries in the last 24 hours, nothing specific, just kind of a numbers based. Um, once you log in, you do get a look at the dashboard, um, which gives you a deeper analysis on what's actually going on, which is on the bottom right. Here you get a quick glance of the total queries that have been scanned and queries blocked, the domains that have been blocked as far as percentage goes, and how many domains you're actually blocking in lifetime. 
you also see the top clients which are sending queries on your network um, so you have a lot of different devices and you want to see which ones are kind of communicating over your um, LAN this will show you what device is sending out the most packets so um, the first thing I wanted to mention was um, there's a couple different levels as far as transparency goes on this um, dashboard there's four different levels level one through four level one would be the the more obscure level which hides domains and hides the user um, so whenever you are kind of going through the logs you do not see specific users or specific domains that are reaching or you know that it's blocking stuff the next level would be level two which hides domain um, and client however it does kind of show you um, a little bit of information regarding the domain just not the specific domain that was reached um, level three um, shows you the client and the user um, however it does not show the specific timestamps level four does show you everything that you will need to see regarding timestamps user um, as far as IP address goes hosting resolution and um, of course the domain that was being reached so depending on your settings you can even customize the query log to display the last hundred block queries or the last hundred allowed by default it does show a mixture of both Sorry. Um, from this query log, you can even block um, blacklist domains, which are originally okayed in a sense, or whitelist domains, which are blocked from the list you might have imported beforehand. Um, I'm sorry, are you guys hearing my dog right now in the background? No. It's, it's don't worry, don't worry. Gotcha. Um, yeah, you're fine. Just give me one second while I let her out. Just to let people know, uh, kind of while Isaac's on, any questions you have about the presentation, if you want to go more in depth about the presentation, just like all the meeting recordings um, will be recorded, all of the slides and any materials that we use will be sent out to you um, after the meeting. So don't worry about that. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, if anyone has dogs, you know how they like to get up and go as they want. So. Um, as I was saying, um, from the lists of sites that are whitelisted or blacklisted, you could also view previously entered domains. Um, what's cool is that you could add domains by their exact name, their exact resolution, or you could add them via regular expression rules. Um, for those of you who have taken different coding classes, um, regular expression rules definitely let you kind of fill in the blanks on certain websites. So, for example, instead of entering every single type of child domain out of facebook.com you could block any type of domain that has to do with facebook.com just by including the correct re um, regular expression rule um, Pyho is even able it's able to translate these regular expressions which gives you the sense that it is very efficient and pretty great if you ask me um, one thing I do want to mention is that any domains added to these tabs will be applied to clients reaching out to this DNS server um, I'll explain a little bit more on exactly what I mean by that um, but, of course, the last thing I did want to mention about the web portal is that it is in dark mode. If you're anything like me, I love dark mode. I feel anything with dark mode is just 10 times better. Okay. So, to dig a little bit more into how you could exactly configure Pi-hole. Um, in the local DNS records tabs, you have the power to add domain IP associations. Um, and internal custom domains added to the list will be whitelisted and traffic allowed to go through. Um, the next cool part about the pie hole is the group management settings. So you do have the option to create group management. Um, this way you could kind of separate your devices, whether they're your own personal devices or if you have um, siblings that you want to put them in a specific group to block certain websites or whatever, what have you. Um, so you get to separate these groups by their client, you get to separate them by what domains are being allowed and what domains are being blocked. Um, then you actually get to, we get to add lists. Add lists are the greatest feature about Pi-hole. Um, they're found all over the internet. They're all third-party lists. There's um, a number of them on Reddit, GitHub, what have you. Um, essentially, add lists are just lists of um, domains. That's all it is. Depending on the correct ad list, some specific um, ad list would cater to possibly YouTube ads, possibly Hulu ads, um, pop-up ads, mobile um, app ads, etc. 
So ad list is what kind of makes or breaks your Pi Hole setup. Finding the right ad lists could be the difference between just blocking little pop-ups or literally blocking any type of YouTube ad or Hulu ad as you use this. Um, what's really cool about this as far as configuring is that it's more than just your home network, if you will. You could even apply it to possible business or enterprise levels because you could even go as far as group management um, by grouping um, IP addresses. So it does support CI, I'm sorry, CIBR um, subnetting. So if you are in a specific business setting where you know users are um, given specific IP addresses depending on, um, um, what's it called? Based on permissions, um, you could also manage the PyHole to kind of attend to those specific permissions as well. Um, so like I mentioned before, PyHole does rely heavily on these um, third-party lists. It's very easy to actually add them. Um, the picture right here actually shows you, you just, um, as far as add a new ad list, you just enter in the URL to this um, specific ad list that you find and it'll kind of update it and add it itself. You can even see from the bottom, I have a number of different ad lists from GitHub, from AdWave, um, some different types of blogs, et cetera. So, <clears throat> um, that being said, you can even create your own custom lists. So if, you do, uh, if you're into it, you could make your own custom ad lists and add your own domain to it and just kind of periodically update that list and set up your Raspberry Pi to kind of read off that list um, periodically. Next thing I wanted to mention was the tail PyHole logs. Um, what's really cool about this is that it shows you in live time the requests being made to PyHole. So it'll actually show you what queries being made to what website and from what IP address being that I had full transparency showing me everything on there. Um, and it'll show you whether it resolves to the correct IP address or if it resolves to a 0.0, .0 network. Um, so there are a lot of different um, specific domains which are being resolved to 0, .0, 0.0 and did not resolve. Most of those being kind of those analytical tracking domains. So. Now that I've been kind of rambling on on some of PyHole's features, let's dive into how you could use it and how it could benefit you. So we have the home application, right? Right now we're all at home, we're all using our own personal networks. How secure are our networks and how personal are they? Um, at home, at minimum, it could be an ad blocker. So imagine you watch a YouTube video. If you're anything like my family members, they love to watch YouTube videos back to back. An hour long video probably holds about 10 different ads in there. Um, setting up PyHole appropriately, you could skip all those ads and just enjoy your video. Same thing with Hulu. If anyone's using Hulu, there's a lot of different ads on there that sometimes last even two minutes sometimes. Having the right ad list, you skip all those ads, you just watch your programming. Um, so, on um, that being said, something really cool about it is that it's not only looking for browser-made requests, so it's not just limited to Hulu or YouTube on your desktop. Um, it also affects your mobile devices or your IoT devices. Um, for example, when I had it running on my home network, it was actually reaching out to my Apple TV, so it was affecting my Hulu and it was affecting YouTube on my Apple TV. Aside from that, I have a lot of different um, smart home appliances, such as a lot of different Hue Phillips light bulbs um, and stuff like that, you actually see those requests being sent through PyHole and you can see how they're being processed and blocked. A lot of the blocked traffic that was seen was actually a lot of analytical domains being reached out from those smart devices. So PyHole did actually preserve a lot of privacy on my end. Um, like I mentioned before, it's a very easy setup. It's all kind of GUI based on your Raspberry Pi, very minimum the CLI base. So if you're not comfortable with the CLI, it does provide that nice GUI setup. It's very low on power consumption, being that it is running on a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pis in general do not take up much, so you won't have a surprise electric bill at the end of the month after running this for a month. Um, and of course, like I said, it's very affordable. Um, as I mentioned before, my setup personally, I probably spent about $10 on it just to get a used keyboard. Um, I had a Raspberry Pi laying around. Um, a Raspberry Pi, you get as cheap as um, $5, um, whereas, you know, you just have to get a mini SD card and what have you. Um, so it is a very cheap um, solution to a problem that we see every day with advertisements. And the next, I just wanted to mention a little bit of the enterprise application or small business application. Um, as mentioned before, it is open source, so it is free. So 
you don't have to pay for anything. There's no subscription prices, none of that. Minimal expenses in hardware, just to kind of reiterate how um, cheap it is of a solution. You can make a top of the line Raspberry Pi, which would be an eight gigabyte Raspberry Pi 4, um, eight gigabyte as far as RAM goes, that costs $75. A micro SD card with 120 gigabytes, you could get that for as low as $25. So right there, we're looking at a very powerful solution, which isn't even needed for your home network, for $100. So $100 solution could do all this and more. Um, as I mentioned before, setup is easy and intuitive. No client-side download needed. So if you are in a small business or enterprise level, you could literally set this up as your DNS server, and all your devices would be reaching out to it, and all of the queries will be processed through that, rather than having to log on to every single device and install some other software on them. Um, as I mentioned before, they did test a four gigabyte RAM VM um, with a single core processor, and they were able to process over a million queries in 24 hours. That's coming straight from the PyHole documentation. Um, and overall, it's just an additional line of defense. Of course, most businesses will probably have their firewall set up as well as their proxy server set up, but it never hurts to have more and more security. Um, and of course, it's just the easy implementation. Um, as I mentioned before, you could use regular expression to just block out blocks of um, malicious domains. Um, so kind of putting it in that perspective, um, something that we all know that attacks many um, businesses nowadays is phishing. Phishing is one of the more, um, I guess, common ways that businesses are kind of breached. Um, a lot of these, the ways that businesses get breached is by you know, a user clicking on a phishing link and it leads them to a credential harvesting domain. And there you go, they got their credentials, they're essentially in the business. Um, something that I noticed in uh, internship that I had over the summer is that a lot of the credential domains were similar with the exception of the trailing end of the website. Um, that being said, using this, you could use regular expressions to just block out all those domains. And within a couple of minutes, you literally blocked out the entire phishing credential harvesting domains. Um, so it's a great um, thing to have on your network. Um, that being said, um, personally, the way I used it over the summer was that my sister was studying for school. She was always on Facebook.com, always getting sidetracked. What I did, I actually blocked Facebook. So whenever you're on my home network and you try to reach Facebook.com, it does not resolve to Facebook.com. That being said, I even blocked her Instagram account and all that as well, being that they're all tied together, they all use Facebook domains. So it's a really cool thing to have and it's very customizable. Um, and that's how the Raspberry Pi will work as your DNS single. So that being said, I did just wanna show you that I'm not lying as far as blocking facebook.com. So I will show you guys what happens when I go to facebook.com. It literally shows you the site cannot be reached. Facebook.com server IP address could not be found. Um, it's not because Facebook.com is down or anything. It's literally because I have blocked it on my home network. Um, it should work as well for Instagram. So if I go to Instagram, as you say to click on that, there you go. It blocks that as well. Um, just to kind of show you why it's doing that. Here's the web, the um, interface that I mentioned before. Just to log into it, when we go to query logs, you see right here, these are the websites that have been blocked. Instagram.com was blocked, the reason being, you see that Facebook on the end right there. Um, you also see in the background, it's also blocking ad services, Google.com, um, and a lot of different double clicks, um, advertisements, if you will. So that's how it kind of works on the back end. If I wanted to block google.com, I just simply cl click blacklist and there you go, it blocks that specific domain. Um, so essentially that's how easy it is. It's all intuitive, it's all GUI based and it's just a great thing to have on your network for that transparency and privacy. And that's all we have on um, my DNS sinkhole. Well, well, I know what I'm doing with my extra Raspberry Pi. That was pretty awesome. Um, thanks for that, Isaac. I, I did not expect that to be as like widely available um, and easy to use as that was, so I appreciate that. And um, the only thing I want to go over is we did have one question um, inside the chat, which was um, from James Warden, and he, he was asking, what's the method of downloading that's a security risk? 
Yeah, so um, it's a pipe install. A pipe install is when you curl a website and you literally use the pipe to kind of download. So let me just go back to the slides, kind of go more into it. Right here. So the one at the bottom is curling the website, right? Um, and then it's pipe bash. Whenever you do a pipe install, you're reaching out to the domain and it's kind of just installing whatever it sees there. Um, that being said, that is very susceptible to a lot of different attacks. Um, someone could potentially um, include a file in there that maybe you're not trying to download. Um, a man in the middle attack could possibly, you know, intercept this and install something else malicious on your website, onto your device. Um, there's no real, you're not really looking at what you're downloading, essentially. You're just kind of double clicking on something and there you go, you're installing it. Um, that's never a great way of installing anything if you're a security person. Um, even if you're not a security person, don't do that. Don't just download something because someone told you to. Um, do your research first. Um, the Git cloning method, you get the whole repository and you could kind of check that back as far as, you know, on the website there are hash values that you can compare to the specific files in that repository. So you can verify if it is the legit program or not and you just go about that way to in um, installing the installer. Hope that answered your question. Okay, yeah, it looks like I covered it. Okay, thank you so much, Isaac. That was great. Um, so now, uh, now that you guys got all little taste into some of the things that we're going to be doing, I want to kind of go over um, a little bit more about the format so that it's clear for everybody. So obviously, we're meeting on WebEx right now, and you can expect us to always meet at WebEx at this link. Um, and we'll be letting you know if the time changes or the day changes. It's probably always going to be Thursday common hour, um, where we'll be going over our presentations, our workshops, and whatnot. So it won't only just be presentations right, um, and informative. It'll also involve workshopping. Right, So we're going to have a lot of different projects that we're working on right now, um, especially for next week. We're going to have a workshop where you can come in and code alongside everyone who's working on it and um, work with us. Ask us any questions you have along the way and we'll get you through it. As well as every time that we do a coding project, all of the files done from that coding project will be put on the SJUC to Git page. So you can feel free to be able to download um, all the files through that. And at the end of next meeting, if I put it up on the Git page immediately, if anyone doesn't know how to use Git, you are more than welcome to stay at the end of next meeting to be able to get a little um, brief and introduction to Git so that you can use it. There is also um, going to be guest speakers from inside the industry. We're working closely with some of the professors right now to come in and speak to you guys, as well as some people that work in the industry at McAfee um, and other various cybersecurity and computer science places, um, and trying to get you guys uh, some outlets for career fairs and just some people that way we can network during this whole entire time. So uh, the way we're going to structure this is doing workshops, presentations, but also just kind of meetings so that we can um, coordinate and network things together because that's an, uh, another important part that we've always offered in the past so we'll be make sure to be on top of that just make sure to stay in tune to either our discord if you're not there and we'll share the um the links again if you can right now isaac that'd be great yeah um, so make sure to check out our discord for messages and you could always ask us any questions inside of discord as well as we're updating our website right now and you'll always get an email blast when anything goes on and also instagram so there's a lot of different ways you should make sure to follow us if you're interested in coming to any of the meetings um, and lastly, there's one thing that I'm excited to share with everybody. So I've been working closely with some people right now. We're going to do something called the semester project. So this is kind of brand new to the, um, either cyber or comp sci. So, um, the idea of a semester project is going to be not during the meeting times. It's going to be a, a different time during the week. You guys can come in and work through every stage of building a website from the bottom up for your portfolio. Right? So I'm going to be showing you how to make a dynamic and uh, responsive website using Python, HTML, CSS, SQL. Right, So we're going to spend um, various weeks throughout this semester and possibly next semester getting you to be able to build your own website, which you can put on your GitHub, as well as um, 
host yourself. That way you can show off all your projects and share your social media links and share all the things that you've been doing for school. So that's what we're going to be doing for the semester project um, that you guys can join us on. And just like all of the meetings and just like um, any of the workshops, all the code will be put week to week on our Git page. So if you ever miss a week, you can just catch yourself right back up by pulling from the repository and then you can come join in with us or um, just watch the video on our YouTube channel. That way you can get filled in with what the last meeting was. And um, that's it. I hope some people turn up. Uh, um, next meeting I'll be going more into exactly what we're going to be doing, but it's um, learning how to use a web framework, learning how to communicate with the database, learning how to do front end, back end of a website, and also how to deploy it on a Linux server and all the different Linux tools that I use to be able to um, host a website. So. Um, Stay tuned for that, and there will be announcements on that. Um, is there anything else you want to go over, Isaac, or any other uh, members of the board? Can so, you answer Aquino's question? Uh, what if you're a freshman, so you don't really know much? Yes. So, the of course, the long semester project, you can always hop in at any time that you want, whether you want to learn any part of it. It doesn't matter. Even if you wanted to learn HTML, but you're not interested in the Python, you can come join in. But even if you're a freshman, guys, we know a lot of people don't have experience to coding or some programming languages. A lot of our meetings are going to be tailored around either people that are new to be able to get started or people that are already experienced to be able to like enrich and supplement their programming skills so don't have any fear if you're new to a language or you don't know a language or a certain tool that's kind of like what we're here for is to introduce you not just focus on the nuances and bettering the people that are already good at coding so um yeah we'll have various meetings um which kind of ties into um, what faizan is going to send at the end of the meeting which is a um a google form do you want to go over that faizan yeah sure so uh, after the after this meeting is over, we'll send out a Google Forms for each one of you to fill out. Where basically it's a bunch of questions asking like what kind of meetings you want us to host throughout the semester because uh, SATA is meant for you guys, and we're trying to help you guys out, get internships, get a job in the field, and anything we can do to help you guys out, like we want to know. So if you guys want, like just drop any meeting ideas in the chat right now. We'll make sure to uh, keep that in mind. Yeah, and just to kind of touch on that a little bit, um, if you have any me meeting ideas or anything you might want to learn or want us to incorporate throughout the semester, drop that in the chat. We are going to send out a Google Forms if you don't want to send it in the chat right now, if you want some time to think about it. Um, we will send out um, a, a Google Form so that you kind of fill that out and we could help you out, um, make that, um, I guess, desire into a reality. Um, just to kind of reiterate, though, for those of you, if you didn't get a chance to, on the top left, we do have a QR code. Um, if you are a current student, feel free to scan that so you could sign in. Um, just to kind of reiterate, some professors we do know like to give extra credit for coming into some of these meetings. Um, this is just how we keep a log of all that to kind of know who's coming. Meeting. I will see you guys next week, and please stay tuned to all of our different medias to make sure that you have um, access to all of our um, meetings, ideas, and plans. And thanks for coming, guys. I really appreciate it.